FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Welcome, and you are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz. It's 129 2018. Hard to believe. Eight and a half percent of the year is almost gone. How do you figure that out? Well, what else is gone is the U.S. savings rate. Seems like all of this so called growth we're having, well, Maybe it's a result of people, of you going more and more into debt. Well, maybe the, the tax change will help you get out of debt a little bit or pay off your debt, service it, keep it going, rolling it over. I don't know, but rates are going up. What's going to happen? Well, always email us, join the show, kl at kerrylutz.com. And we're back with John Rubino. And John, what is going on? Hey, Kerry. Well, we got a lot of trends on uh, collision course right now. Um, so follow along with me while I throw out some numbers. The, uh, the fourth quarter GDP growth was uh, about 2.8%, which is a little below target, but still you know, completely acceptable in, in, um, in light of what has come before during this recovery. But if you look a little deeper, you see that it, it's mostly due to the savings rate going down. In other words, people are maxing out their credit cards to buy stuff and that is temporarily boosting um, the economy. But if you subtract that out, in other words, if you assume that the savings rate didn't change in the fourth quarter and that people didn't borrow all that money, um, GDP growth was less than 1%. You know, it was like 0.8%, which is um, trending towards recession when, when it drops from last year's level to 0.8%. Um, and at the same time that's happening, interest rates are, are really jumping. The, the 10-year treasury yield is up a full percentage point from its 2016 low, um, which means that the interest carrying cost on all the debts that we're taking on right now at pretty much every level of society, you know, most debts are variable rate in some way, either it's short term and it has to be rolled over or it is connected to some kind of a reference rate which is frequently the, the 10 year treasury yield. Uh, that means interest costs go up when interest rates go up. And we're seeing that pretty much everywhere in the US economy right now. And that that's interesting because at the same time we're borrowing all this money, the cost of carrying that new debt is going way up, which means there's a, you know, a limit to this process. We can't keep borrowing if the savings rate is already at uh, a 10 year low and we can't carry our debts if the interest rate on those debts keeps going up and up and up at the same time we don't have any savings left with which to uh, to to um, manage our debts so that that is something that can't continue those trends cannot continue for too much longer because they uh, they cancel each other out you know they one becomes a limiting factor on the other and then everything stops which means the the economy is going to have trouble growing next year unless something else big happens. So then the question is, what what will keep things going? If, if consumers can't continue to borrow and interest rates are high enough to, um, to make debts onerous for everybody else, uh, where do we get growth? And, you know, it's not clear right now. As you mentioned, the tax cut puts a little bit more money in the, the pockets of the 1%, basically. Uh, but those guys are already, you know, have record incomes. So it's not clear that corporations as a group are going to start borrowing and spending more in the year ahead because uh, corporate debt is already at record levels. Um, so some companies are announcing positive things where they're um, they're giving bonuses to people or they're building new factories and stuff like that. So that's a, you know, a, a somewhat of a positive going forward. But remember, the government is borrowing that money and then giving it to corporations who are doing things with it. So it's, it's in effect kind of an infrastructure program that the government is um, is implementing via tax cuts. Um, since it's borrowed money to begin with, then you have to wonder what the government's finances look like as its interest costs go up. Because remember, it's rolling a lot of short-term debt over now. And as uh, short-term interest rates go up, the government's interest costs go up. It's also borrowing at the long end of the spectrum as well. You know, we're, we're going to run a trillion dollar deficit this year, it looks like. And that's only going to increase with tax cuts and raising, rising military spending and the new 
new infrastructure program that the government is talking about now. You know, we're going to borrow a trillion dollars a year for the next 10 years, but we're going to be borrowing it at higher and higher interest rates while we're rolling over a lot of old debt at higher and higher rates. So the government's interest costs are going to go up in ways that may not be apparent now to people. You know, and that, that's kind of a, a, a vicious cycle when you're borrowing more and more money and the cost of that borrowing is going up, which raises your future borrowing because you've got to pay more for your uh, your existing debt and that you have to borrow for if you're already running a deficit. Uh, so we're finally entering the early stages of the the dollar collapse story death spiral. You know, it doesn't mean that it's necessarily going to continue into that death spiral, but uh, this is what the early stage of that process looks like. So it'll be really interesting to see what the catalysts are for growth in the year ahead, um, if any. Yeah. Yeah, well, we've been talking about this. So you're saying that this is the Minsky moment we've well, all been waiting for? I'm saying that the early stages of something like that tend to look like what's happening right now. But there have been a lot of false alarms <laughs> in the last 10 years. You know, no it has seemed like the system was going to blow up several times, um, beginning with the um, the housing bubble bursting in 2007, 2008. You know, and then after that, there, there were other signs of distress that popped up every once in a while. And none of them really came up came to anything because the government was running massive QE programs. You know, we were papering over our problems by creating lots of new currency and dumping it out of the system and, and lots of new credit via government borrowing. And that allowed the system, well, that pushed up asset prices, which in turn um, kept the system growing in a fairly stable way because that was pumping so much money into the hands of at least, you know, the 1% who were spending some of it, you know, and, and, and so we, we had a bit of a wealth effect from rising asset prices. Um, but that wealth effect was due, or those rising asset prices were due to the government or all the governments of the world creating huge amounts of new currency and pumping it out into the system. Well, that, that's changed now. We've got quantitative tightening in the U.S. where the Fed is shrinking its balance sheet by letting its existing bond portfolio run off as the bonds mature. Uh, and that's not surprisingly coinciding with rising interest rates. Um, because as the Fed tightens, you know, they, they use QE to push down interest rates. So as they do away with QE, it's not a surprise that interest rates start to rise towards more historically normal levels. Uh, and that's that's the kind of thing that eventually, you know, at some point, there's a number on the 10 year Treasury yield that starts destabilizing the financial markets. And the question is, where is that? point. You know, is it 2.8%? Is it 3%? Is it 6%? And and that's what we'll find out if we keep on, on this path um, without doing something to stop the trend of rising interest rates and increasing debt. And it's not clear what we can do. You know, if they go back to QE again, they're going to be doing it in the context of a, a market that's already kind of overheated by a lot of measures where asset prices are at record levels pretty much across the board. If they decide to start buying assets at this level in, as a way of of, uh, keeping the economy growing, then you're pushing asset prices up into the stratosphere, you know, into valuation territory that has always and everywhere preceded a gigantic crash. And that's kind of the box they're in right now. If they don't ease, then you've got all these trends that are pointing towards uh, some kind of a collision that leads to a crash. If they do ease, then you get valuations on stocks and bonds that are probably unmanageable in the long term. And it's not clear that there's a middle way. <laughs> so yeah. we'll, we'll see what it is they do and what the uh, the outcome of it is. But just looking at the numbers, it doesn't look like there's a way out. So 2018 could, could be a really interesting year, both you know for, for your money personally and in a theoretical sense, you know, because we're doing right. things that have never been done before. And yes, we are. The, those things are creating problems that we've never had to deal with before. So mm. fascinating time on every level, Kerry. Yeah. These are amazing times we're living in, John. So we had this whole Davos get together. Is Davos different than the Bilderbergs? I, I just uh, don't quite, I thought that maybe Davos is an offshoot of the Bilderbergs. If any of you out there know the answer to that question, please email us, kl at kerrylutz.com. And by the way, email us uh, to get our white paper that John and I put together on cryptocurrencies. And I think you're really going to enjoy it. We put a lot of work into it. And no, it's not going to 
tell you how to get a digital wallet and how to buy and sell cryptos, you can watch a YouTube and figure that out. You don't need us for that. Rather, we get under the hood and we talk about what is involved in a cryptocurrency. Is it a currency? I call them kind of crypto wannabe currencies, John. Uh, but uh, you know, we'd be remiss, John, if we didn't talk about the major decline that hit Bitcoin over the past couple of weeks. You know, it's trading right now in the low 11,000s. And that's uh, that's pretty major, isn't it? Well, yeah, it, it uh, I think it touched 20,000 or got very close very to close. it in its run and then dropped by basically 50 percent, which Okay, two ways of looking at this. One is that's that's normal in the uh, the parabolic stage of a bull market. You know, you get some serious corrections, uh, but that doesn't necessarily end the bull market because something has to go to its intrinsic value and then overshoot. That's that's typically how bull markets work. And we really don't know what the intrinsic value of a cryptocurrency like Bitcoin is. That that's something that good question. That's yeah. We'll we'll know with retrospect. You know, with, with 2020 hindsight, 10 years from now, we'll be able to say, oh yeah, yeah. You know, here, here's how you should have done the math back then. But we we don't know what the math is right now that tells us what these things are worth. So this is either a screaming buy the dip opportunity or uh, the end of the era of Bitcoin. And it's not clear which is which because we, we don't know, first of all, which cryptocurrencies are going to end up being the dominant ones if cryptocurrencies end up being important players in the global financial system going forward. We don't know how the bit or the uh, the blockchain is going to play out um, in all the different markets is being tried out for. You know, I, I think the most interesting crypto ish story right now is that they're starting to apply it to gold yeah. you know sprott we and, know that uh, yeah we talked to rick yeah yeah and is it perth mint also who's doing it they're they're um, not about perth doing it but it wouldn't surprise me yeah so somebody else is doing it besides sprott and the the idea will be that uh, yeah that you know the gold stays in a vault somewhere but the blockchain allows you to transfer ownership of that gold instantaneously anywhere in the world, zero friction, you know, the, the, the blockchain ideal, um, which is vastly superior to the current way of transferring value, especially with gold and silver, which aren't that portable. You know, you don't carry yeah. gold bars across borders anymore. <laughs> Not if you know what's you. good for yep. you. <laughs> that, uh, yeah, that, that guarantees you at a minimum an hour's yeah. worth of grilling. Oh you know why you do God. it? Yeah, like, uh, yeah. Oh. And, and that limits the value of gold and silver in the marketplace because the, the, the portability of it um, is is a real hassle in today's world. So you can't take it with you when you go somewhere. But if it's part of a blockchain system mm -hmm. where you can transfer your gold in effect from here to Switzerland with a mouse click, then all of a sudden gold and silver become important well, kinds of cryptocurrencies, you know, in, in, in yeah. a sense, um, they've got a physical reality and a cyber reality. And, and and to that extent, I think the blockchain is a very big deal for precious metals. And we should be paying attention to that, because if um, gold and silver, once they're transferable in that way, mm. become caught up in the Bitcoin slash cryptocurrency mania, uh, you know, you could see spectacular price increases because those are small markets relative to the, the world of paper. You know, there are orders of magnitude, um, more paper currencies out there and credit and financial instruments that are based on crypto, on um, fiat currencies. Uh, then there are precious metals out there. So just a tiny fraction of the investable paper wealth in the world flowing into precious metals and cryptocurrencies based on precious metals could be a catalyst for that could send these things to the moon you know i i oh, yeah. did a commercial a while ago where i predict 200 dollars silver which sounds outrageous in this world it but let does. those things be part of the cryptocurrency complex and uh, 200 dollars silver from here is, is minuscule as a move compared to what some of the cryptocurrencies have done lately oh for sure uh you know, it's I think it's a game changer for all uh, for everything, literally everything in the crypto space. Once there's really a gold back to crypto coin, I think it, it changes everything. John, I mean, you could tell me what you think. But the reason why is that currently the only uh, cryptocurrency I know of that really has uh, intrinsic value <laughs> and you're going to laugh about it is a guy that I met in at the uh, North American Bitcoin conference and his cryptocurrency is backed by cellular minutes. 
<laughs> you know, okay, you, you can laugh at that. I mean, it's kind of entertaining when you think about it, right? Uh, but it really, I guess they do have an intrinsic value of some kind, right? Really? Don't they? You think? Well, um, yeah, not on my service because I think I have unlimited. Yeah, but, well, if you have unlimited, it, <laughs> then it's still worth something because uh, you would have to pay for minutes if it didn't, right? If it didn't have anything. Well, well, see, that's what's so interesting about the concept of the blockchain is you can you can pretty much use it as a value transfer mechanism for any kind of an un underlying asset. And so we're trying to figure out now which assets are um, are good for that kind of thing, <laughs> which yeah. which ones aren't. Uh, and and so we need a decade basically to work this whole thing out. And uh -huh. it's going to be a fascinating decade. You know, you know, as as a um, guy with an economics degree, I, I'm just blown away by this world. This is so much fun to watch because these are markets at their rawest, most elemental form out there everywhere. You know, we've got creative destruction going on in every aspect of every major society around the world. And so it looks like chaos and turmoil, but it's actually the ecosystem operating as it should. You know, this is this is how the world should work, a, a well-designed, fully functioning world that's based on free markets and private property ought to have innovation and, and, uh, and new things coming along all the time. And that's what today's world is like. So, you know, we're making a lot of in incredibly silly mistakes with debt and with the environment and several other things, geopolitics for sure. Oh, God. But in, in the um, technology slash economy part of the global financial system, it's fascinating. So much wild yeah. stuff is happening. And, uh, and, and it's right out of um, Economics 101 textbooks, how it should be happening. So this is fun. But the outcome is uncertain. Uh, that's another aspect of creative destruction is that you really can't tell ahead of time exactly how these things are going to play out because uh, it's something new, replace something old, replacing something old. And that's an inherently hard to predict process because all you've got is the history of the old thing. You don't have any history with the new thing. No, you and, don't. and the new thing, therefore, is going to do new things, you know, and, and I don't know. I, I think the, the blockchain idea is, is one of several things. You know, energy is another one where solar and wind are basically killing coal, you know, and, and will soon kill oil. You know, that's a, that's a, a great thing to watch and it's fascinating. And, and uh, there, there are actually some societal benefits to that process. Same thing with the blockchain. You know, it could improve the way a lot of things work, but we can't know exactly how it all plays out, out ahead of time. You know, we just have to kind of watch it. And in a lot of cases from a safe distance. You know, I've thought about this. You know, we've talked about it so many times, John applications for the blockchain. Mm -hmm. And one of the greatest applications is, I talked about uh, counterfeit aircraft parts, blockchain being able to track the part from the moment it's manufactured and each time it gets sold along the line to distributors and eventually to end users. What about counterfeit pharmaceuticals? That is a huge problem. It seems like most of them probably come out of China. And what if you're able to track every lot of pharmaceuticals through every step of the supply chain till they get to the drugstore. And then, you know, if somebody's trying to counterfeit the lot number or something like that, or there's unique identifiers that they can't counterfeit, then, you know, if it's not on the blockchain, we aren't buying your drugs. Right? Yeah. Yeah. See, that, that's something you would never think of um, until you really dig into the, the implications of this new technology. But yes, that's a big deal. You know, you saw the story about uh, the the um, the amount of counterfeit fentanyl they just caught uh, oh, that yeah. was on the way from uh, Mexico to the U.S. Yeah, and it's enough to kill everybody. 10 million people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's counterfeit. You know, you don't even know for sure what's in there, but it's just basically heroin cooked down to, you know, a pill yeah. form, apparently, and right. branded fentanyl. Um, yeah. So... That's a use for a blockchain system, and, and there are a hundred more, it sounds like. Uh, uh -huh. You know, personally, I like the gold and silver thing as a, as a gold bug, you know, because yeah. that makes me lots of money, personally. I want to see that happen. But there are a million other things that, that could happen out there that are beneficial for society from these new technologies mm -hmm. that are coming along. And they're going to happen. That's the thing. They are going to happen because the blockchain, to boil it down to its simplest uh, 
iteration is just a public ledger of every transaction associated with whether it's that currency or gold storage in the Royal Mint of Canada or or prescription drugs that are manufactured. And it's not just the the uh, the bad stuff. It's like every drug is because drugs are the ultimate branded item really uh, lend itself to being tracked by the blockchain and controlled in such a way. I mean, it's it's a, this is a major innovation for all counterfeit goods, uh, any counterfeit goods, but the ones that really pose the biggest threat. That's what we're talking about. And that's that's pretty, pretty, pretty major here. Uh, it's an innovation that really will change your life because you could have taken counterfeit drugs and not known it like your Lipitor that you take. You think, oh, that came from whoever makes Lipitor now. I think it's generic. But all these things really, really uh, open up the world to the integrity of the blockchain. Like I said, blockchain can be used for good or for evil. But one thing is for sure, the blockchain itself is uncorruptible and immutable. Hey, and to know that, what do you need ETFs for then, John? Because you don't really know if all the stuff that they say is in the ETF, whether it's a gold ETF or whether they're owning corporate securities or not. You don't know whether they own it or not. But with the blockchain, you will know that they own it. You will be able to prove it and then combine that with an external audit several times a year. And you've got the best assurance that you're actually buying what you think you're buying. Well, now, now carry on. The flip side of that is that these these exchanges are getting hacked all the time. You know, you you oh, saw yeah. the uh, oh, the Japanese uh, exchange that just got hacked for um, five hundred million dollars of, of Bitcoin that were sucked out of it. You know, and, and <laughs> then somebody in in Britain this last week was robbed at gunpoint. Somebody broke yeah. into an exchange. I heard, yeah, the the guy who owned the exchange and they made him give him like a million bucks or they were going to kill him. Yeah, and he gave yeah. it. And, yeah. And and so and and also we got the, the Puerto Rico example of a while ago when their uh, electricity went down for months and the internet didn't work they couldn't access any of their yeah, well, crypto coins or any other cyber assets so that can't happen that here stuff, John that can't happen here yeah <laughs> <laughs> but you know you you have to throw all of that stuff into the mix. Mm. And it's really not clear how it all plays out because of the uh, the incredible benefits weighed against the apparently extreme downsides to these things. Uh, and, and so we have to try it and we have to get a lot of people involved in it and come up with new ideas and, and, and they're see how it all it. plays out. But we're, we're really just at the beginning stage of this process. This is the second inning of oh, a nine yeah. inning game, which could go into extra innings. You know, it could be an 18 inning game before we actually find out how all this plays out. Yeah. And they are trying right now to link up credit cards to cryptocurrencies, which would then really make it a currency because it's hooked into your Visa, MasterCard, Amex card. It's a company doing it, but I don't, think at this point wall street really wants it to happen well, so you know the slow the, the, adop adoption yeah the debit and credit cards based on bitcoin aren't actually what people say they are you're not spending bitcoin when you mm -hmm. do that where you're you're converting your bitcoin to dollars and then spending it you right. know if you go to walmart and use that credit card walmart didn't take bitcoin what they did was they took dollars that you converted right. your bitcoin into uh, so that's not exactly spending bitcoin yet you know but you have to makes... have merchants being directly willing to take it before yeah. you're actually spending it what it does though is it makes your bitcoin or other cryptocurrency directly convertible instantaneously convertible but just like you go to europe and you use your amex card to buy something in euros Right now, like they say, they don't charge you a fee when they convert, but they don't charge you an obvious fee. The fact is they're making a profit on the foreign currency conversion. That's mm -hmm. a major part of banks business FX. So they are making the profit. They're just not charging you a flat fee of 2% like they used to, but they're still, I've seen it with PayPal send it to, to people in Canada and look at the actual conversion rate, the spot rate that's on Kitco, and they're giving it a haircut. So yeah. so what you're saying is they got to make money. Uh, Visa and MasterCard are going to make money. The exchanges, those are just exchanges when you get down to it. They call them clearing houses. But what's a clearing house? An exchange. And that's where you go to settle transactions. So I totally agree with you. Well, we'll leave this. Just get the uh, get the white paper on cryptocurrencies. I think it will clear up a lot of your questions. Hey, if you've been 
been trading cryptocurrencies for nine years, you probably don't have any questions, but it still is, raises some important issues that you need to think about, like what is money and where does money go? How does it travel? All these things. And then the effect of the blockchain upon it. Anyway, KL at KerryLutz.com. Make sure you check out John's site, DollarCollapse.com. Sign up for both our newsletters. Email us because you got to have questions. And that email address again is KL at KerryLutz.com. Twitter feed at Kerry Lutz. And Facebook page is Financial Survival Network. Till next Monday, John. See you, Kerry. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. For a lot of old debt at higher and higher rates. So the government's interest costs are going to go up in ways that may not be apparent now to people. You know, and that, that's kind of a, a, a vicious cycle when you're borrowing more and more money and the cost of that borrowing is going up, which raises your future borrowing because you've got to pay more for your uh, your existing debt and that you have to borrow for if you're already running a deficit. Uh, so we're finally entering the early stages of the the dollar collapse story death spiral. You know, it doesn't mean that it's necessarily going to continue into that death spiral, but uh, this is what the early stages stage of that process looks like. So it'll be really interesting to see what the catalysts are for growth in the year ahead, um, if any. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we've been talking about this. So you're saying that this is the Minsky moment we've well, all been waiting for? I'm saying that the early stages of something like that tend to look like what's happening right now. But there have been a lot of false alarms in the last 10 years. You know, no it has seemed like the system was going to blow up several times, um, beginning with the um, the housing bubble bursting in 2007, 2008. You know, and then after that, there, there were other signs of distress that popped up every once in a while. And none of them really came up came to anything because the government was running massive QE programs. You know, we were papering over our problems by creating lots of new currency and dumping it out of the system and, and lots of new credit via government borrowing. And that allowed the system, well, that pushed up asset prices, which in turn um, kept the FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Welcome, and you are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz. It's 1-29-2018. Hard to believe, eight and a half percent of the year is almost gone. How do you figure that out? Well, what else is gone is the U.S. savings rate. Seems like all of this so-called growth we're having, well, maybe it's a result of people, of you going more and more into debt. Well, maybe the, the tax change will help you get out of debt a little bit or pay off your debt, service it, keep it going, rolling it over. I don't know, but rates are going up. What's going to happen? Well, always email us. Join the show, kl at kerrylutz.com. And we're back with John Rubino. And John, what is going on? Hey, Kerry. Well, we got a lot of trends on a uh, collision course right now. Um, so follow along with me while I throw out some numbers. The, uh, the fourth quarter GDP growth was uh, about... 2.8%, which is a little below target, but still, you know, completely acceptable in in, um, in light of what has come before during this recovery. But if you look a little deeper, you see that it's mostly due to the savings rate going down. In other words, people are maxing out their credit cards to buy stuff, and that is temporarily boosting um, the economy. But if you subtract that out, in other words, if you system growing in a fairly stable way, because that was pumping so much money into the hands of at least, you know, the one percent who were spending some of it, you know, and 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 so we we had a bit of a wealth effect from rising asset prices. Um, but that wealth effect was due, or those rising asset prices were due to the government or all the governments of the world creating huge amounts of new currency and pumping it out into the system. Well, that that's changed now. We've got quantitative tightening in the U.S., where the Fed is shrinking its balance sheet by letting its existing bond portfolio run off as the bonds mature, uh, and. That's not surprisingly coinciding with rising interest rates. Um, 
because as the Fed tightens, you know, they, they use QE to push down interest rates. So as they do away with QE, it's not a surprise that interest rates start to rise towards more historically normal levels. Uh, and that's that's the kind of thing that eventually, you know, at some point, there's a number on the 10 year treasury yield that starts destabilizing the financial markets. And the question is, where is that? point. You know, is it 2.8%? Is it 3%? Is it 6%? And and that's what we'll find out if we keep on, on this path um, without doing something to stop the trend of rising interest rates and increasing debt. And it's not clear what we can do. You know, if they go back to QE again, they're going to be doing it in the context of a, a market that's already kind of overheated by a lot of measures where asset prices are at record levels pretty much across the board. If they decide to start buying assets at this level in, as a way of uh, keeping the economy growing, then you're pushing asset prices up into the stratosphere, you know, into valuation. Assume that the savings rate didn't change in the fourth quarter and that people didn't borrow all that money. Um, GDP growth was less than 1%. You know, it was like 0.8%, which is um, you know, trending towards recession when, when it drops from last year's level to 0.8%. Um, and at the same time that's happening, interest rates are, are really jumping. The 10-year the treasury yield is up a full percentage point from its 2016 low, um, which means that the interest carrying cost on all the debts that we're taking on right now at pretty much every level of society. You know, most debts are variable rate in some way, either it's short term and it has to be rolled over or it is connected to some kind of a reference rate, which is frequently the 10 year treasury yield. Uh, that means interest costs go up when interest rates go up. And we're seeing that pretty much everywhere in the U.S. economy right now. And that that's interesting because at the same time we're borrowing all this money, the cost of carrying that new debt is going way up, which means there's, a, you know, a limit to this process. We can't keep borrowing if the savings rate is already at uh, a 10 year low and we can't carry our debts if the interest rate on those debts keeps going up and up and up. At the same time, we don't have any savings left with which to uh, to, to um, manage our debts. So that that is something that can't continue. Those trends cannot continue for too much longer because they uh, they cancel each other out. You know, they, one becomes a limiting factor on the other and then everything stops, which means the, the economy is going to have trouble growing next year unless something else big happens. So then the question is, what will keep things going? If, if consumers can't continue to borrow and interest rates are high enough to, um, to make debts onerous for everybody else, uh, where do we get growth? And, you know, it's not clear right now. As you mentioned, the tax cut puts a little bit more money in the, the pockets of the 1%, basically. Uh, but those guys already, you know, had record incomes. So it's not clear that corporations as a group are going to start borrowing and spending more in the year ahead because uh, corporate debt is already at record levels. Um, so some companies are announcing positive things where they're um, they're giving bonuses to people or they're building new factories and stuff like that. So that's a, you know, a, a somewhat of a positive going forward. But remember, the government is borrowing that money and then giving it to corporations who are doing things with it. So it's, it's in effect kind of an infrastructure program that the government is um, is implementing via tax cuts. Um, since it's borrowed money to begin with, then you have to wonder what the government's finances look like as its interest costs go up. Because remember, it's rolling a lot of short-term debt over now. And as uh, short-term interest rates go up, the government's interest costs go up. It's also borrowing at the long end of the spectrum as well. You know, we're, we're going to run a trillion dollar deficit this year, it looks like. And that's only going to increase with tax cuts and raising, rising military spending and the new infrastructure program that the government is talking about now, you know, we're going to borrow a trillion dollars a year for the next 10 years, but we're going to be borrowing it at higher and higher interest rates while we're rolling 